Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Get it? Glass dome. Gas dome. Are you with me? You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Now, one thing I really want your generation to embrace is that the Earth is a closed system. The Earth is a closed system. We cannot leave the Earth. There's no place to go. Now, a lot of scholars are out there today suggesting or demanding that the word firmament is simply an expanse. It's the expanse of the air, the atmosphere, and the vacuum of space. Have you heard that before? The firmament is just an expanse. Anybody heard that before? I hear it from my detractors all the time. Funny thing is, the Hebrews and the Greeks disagree with that, especially the Hebrew scholars that took their Hebrew texts and translated the Hebrew into Greek. So these are Hebrew people who understand their Hebrew culture, their Hebrew scriptures. They took the Hebrew words and translated them into Greek for the Septuagint. And the word that they chose for the Hebrew word rakia when they translated it into Greek was stereoma. Uh, and that word, the origin of that word, is a combining uh, form borrowed from Greek where it me meant solid, used with reference to hardness, solidity, three-dimensionality in the formation of compound words. And when you just look at uh, other online resources such as blueletterbible.com, look up the word rakia, You'll see right there, it's an extended surface, solid, expanse, firmament, expanse, flat as base, support, firmament of vault of heaven, supporting waters above, considered by Hebrews as solid and supporting waters above. Over and over and over again, you see that the Hebrews understood it to be solid. The word rakia comes from a root word, raka. Uh, if I, forgive me if I'm pronouncing these words wrong. Um, and when you look up that word, that root word, it talks about uh, to beat, to stamp out, to spread out, to stretch, to stamp out, to beat out, like when you're pounding metal, spreading metal out by beating on it. I don't know how you can beat on air <laughs> to create an expanse. Uh, and Job, which I believe actually predates Genesis, comes right out and tells you. In Job chapter 37, verse 18, pick your translation. I grew up in the King James. So the King James says, Hast thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong as a molten looking glass? What's a molten looking glass? It's a mirror made out of beaten down metal. <laughs> I mean, Job comes right out and tells you this thing is hard. Because the thing is, the scientists are literally saying that they're bouncing signals off of the sky. Now their excuse is saying it's a shell of electrically charged particles, but this seems to be their excuse and their only way to describe what they are witnessing. Because if you think about it with common sense, the air is supposed to be thinner the farther you go up. And so how are they possibly bouncing signals off of the sky? You see, satellites do not exist. They're just bouncing signals off this reflective dome firmament. The reflective properties of the dome firmament is part of the reason why you see rainbows, sun dogs, and more. Because according to my research, the dome is most likely some form of reflective material. In Egyptian mythology, Newt is the goddess of the sky. She is seen star-covered, arching over the earth, representing its dome. In Greek mythology, Uranus was the primeval god of the sky. The Greeks imagined the sky as a solid dome of brass, whose edges descended to rest upon the outermost limits of the flat earth. Uranus was the literal sky, and Gaia the earth. In the Roman era, he was often depicted as Eon, god of eternal time, in the form of a man holding the zodiac wheel, standing above Gaia. The Hebrews believed the sky was a solid dome. They called this solid vault of heaven the Rakia, with the sun, moon, and stars beneath. In Indian mythology, the dome is called Brahmanda. This is the structure of the world according to Finnish mythology, showing a dome with the stars projected onto it. In the aboriginal conception of the world, the earth was circular and flat, covered by the dome of the sky, which stretched out to the horizon. And there have been many ancient artifacts found, which the mainstream has called stone handbags. But as you can see, there's no area to even carry anything. These were not handbags. They're artistic depictions of the dome here on flat earth. 
So many ancient peoples knew about this dome and wove it into their worldview. The elite would have us believe that these are just made-up cosmologies, invented by peoples who were too scientifically ignorant to understand reality. But there is no coincidence that the same description of a flat earth and dome is so common. These cultures around the world had special knowledge about the nature of this place we are living in. And it may be hard to see tonight, but we are all standing under a glass ceiling right now. Something really strange going on about 100 kilometers up. And it's not really talked about much. I think the Wild Heretic website's gone into this quite well. I want to accentuate it. Now the thermosphere starts around 100 kilometers up. This is sort of the area where NASA seems to have a lot of trouble. But that's for another subject. What happens at 100 kilometers up, it goes from around minus 50, 60 degrees, which is pretty cold, to well over 200 degrees in a really thin layer of altitude, all around 100 kilometers up. What would cause this drastic change of temperature? What, what could do this? What, what could be there? I mean, I've personally not seen enough evidence to suggest anything's even gone past this 100 kilometer range, but that's for another time. Now, the ionosphere is around 60 kilometers up to 600 kilometers up, and it's full of ionized radiation. And many communication technologies bounce off this. They bounce off whatever's going off, going on around 100 kilometers up. So it's like there's a layer there. Even the Northern Lights, they start at 100 kilometer up as well. They never come below 100 kilometers. And they go up to around 120 kilometers usually, but can go up to 500 kilometers. This is a quote from an article uh, taken from ibtimes.com. And I've got the link there for that. Uh, it says, the Earth is protected from fast-moving killer electrons by an invisible plasma shield. <clears throat> Impossible radio transmissions in 1915 where essentially the entire world could hear a transmission. That was before satellites, obviously. Okay. First transmission of the BBC Empire Service was broadcast on the 19th of December, 1932, from this building. And it shows here basically... All the places it could hear. Okay, 1915, Arlington, Virginia. They're able to hear this message, this transmission, uh, in Europe, Hawaii, which is basically impossible. Okay, without satellites, allegedly, you know, allegedly without satellites. So it's kind of curious why they were able to do that. It kind of defies heliocentrism, considering that we're allegedly on a convex ball. There's no way for those radio transmissions going in a straight line to curve around the Earth, right? Um, and even if you have the bounce effect that they allegedly, they, and they don't even explain that right. Uh, even if you take into consideration like AM radio and the bounce effect and all this type of stuff, and other types of uh, um, frequencies that can bounce off the alleged uh, ionosphere, which is another quandary right there. How does it bounce off this mysterious ionosphere? Why does everything bounce off this ionosphere? You know, the Kármán line. High above the Earth's atmosphere, harmful electrons that make up the outer band of the Van Allen radiation belt travel at nearly the speed of light, pelting everything in their path. Exposure to such high energy radiation can harm satellite electronics and pose serious health risks to astronauts. However, despite their intense energy, these electrons circling around the planet's equator cannot come below 7,200 miles from the Earth's surface due to the shield, scientists said in a... The height of the Hevizide layer, which is the dome of the sky, has been measured by the time taken by radar waves to return to Earth. This distance has been given as being from 40 to 50 kilometers in the daytime and 90 kilometers during nighttime. But the figure obtained for the day may be considered unreliable, since it may well be believed that an acceleration takes place in the propagation of the waves due to the heat of the sun. It is known, 
on the other hand, that the thickness of the atmosphere has also been measured. But the atmosphere is invisible, and since the dome is the only surface on which the eye can rest, it is clear that the thickness of the atmosphere means the height of the dome. In the 11th century the Arabs, by measuring the duration of twilight, assuming that their method is acceptable, established that this thickness is 92 kilometers, and nowadays, by the same method, a figure of 64 kilometers has been obtained. It's almost like these electrons are running into a glass wall in space, Daniel Baker of the University of Colorado Boulder and the study's lead author said. In 1947, during Operation High Jump, Admiral Byrd discovered the outer boundaries of the firmament. Many of his men's planes were disappearing very quickly. A lot of them were crashing into invisible barriers and disintegrating in mid-flight. It was shortly after discovering this barrier that Byrd discontinued his mission and returned home. What happened is Byrd's planes encountered the walls of the vaulted dome. Soon after, many measures like the Antarctica Treaty and a consistent military presence at the ice wall were put in place to cover up the structure of our enclosed world system, while also preventing unwarranted intrusion which could lead to an announcement of the discovery of the Earth's dome. And in that film we show footage of the uh, Navy planes landing in these lakes. But even more so, he found, uh, to his amazement, that his planes were disappearing very quickly. A lot of them crashed into invisible barriers and disintegrated in mid-flight. This is an indication that the Germans had already perfected the force field shields, and they were up and operational around the German colony at Neuschwabenland. Somewhat like the shields created by force fields in Star Trek that were used to repel alien weapons, we are seeing an invisible shield blocking these electrons. It's an extremely puzzling phenomenon. Lightning is a phenomenon which results from the electrification of the vault, but it must be explained that the luminous branches and ramifications which are observed in what is called forked lightning are not lightning at all, strictly speaking neither do they traverse the atmosphere as is believed. They correspond to luminous electrical currents, which travel in the vault of the sky itself, where they follow irregular tracks, probably metallic veins, and it can also be seen that they adopt the convex shape of the vault. These currents contribute eventually to the accumulation at a certain spot of the quantity of electricity which is required to cause a discharge towards the Earth which occurs then in a direct line. The invisible shield, dubbed the plasmaspheric hiss, is made up of very low frequency electromagnetic waves in the Earth's upper atmosphere. It has been calculated that the height of meteors never exceeds 90 kilometers, and this figure confirms the estimate, which is given further on of the probable distance of the vault of the sky from the surface of the Earth. The comets, meteors, and shooting stars are phenomena, which also have their origin, like the so-called forked lightning, in the mass of the vault. The author, definitely, knows this to be the case. Comets are spontaneous luminous manifestations, which are created by electrical reactions occurring in the vault of the sky, and this explains their unexpected and sudden appearances, as well as their rapid and erratic movements indifferently direct or retrograde. The passage of a comet is not accompanied by sound, that is to say that there is no electrical discharge like in the case of lightning, which causes the vault to split and detonate. It can be surmised, that lightning takes place in the thickness of the vault, whereas a comet is a surface phenomenon. The orbit of comets which may be seen to sweep across the vast expanse of the sky is described as parabolic. This means, in fact, since the passage takes place on the surface of the dome, that the orbit follows exactly the curvature of same and acquires, therefore, a seemingly parabolic shape. The formation of comets seems to be due to the influence of the satellite disks of the Earth as they pass at certain points of the vault of the sky, otherwise, when they occupy certain degrees of the zodiac, 
particularly the 29th degree of Sagittarius. In the case of Inks Comet of December 21, 1795, the Sun was at the 29th degree of Sagittarius. In that of Brooks Comet of November LLTH 1911, Mercury was passing at the same degree, and again for Donati's Comet, October 2, 1858, it was Mars which was effecting its passage at this very spot. The same remark applies, moreover, to the third degree of various signs, particularly Gemini. In the last case mentioned, that of Donati's Comet, Uranus was at the third degree of Gemini. For Halley's Comet which returned on March 4, 1910, Mercury was at the same degree, Venus at the second degree of Libra, Mars at the second degree of Cancer, while simultaneously Saturn passed at the 29th degree of Aries, etc. All these circumstances, which cannot be coincidences, point evidently to the existence of a mathematical law, governing the formation of comets, through the combined agencies of the satellites, when they pass simultaneously at various degrees of the zodiac, and since the satellites have a regular motion it follows that the periodicity of comets, if it does exist, may be due to this fact. Shooting stars are not to be confused with the stars in the ordinary sense, which form the constellations and move at a very slow pace. They are luminous manifestations, which glide rapidly on the surface of the vault of heaven, without any electrical discharge towards the earth. They are, thus, related to vault lightning, especially as they sometimes can be heard to emit crackling sounds like sparks. Meteors are also luminous phenomena, resulting from electrical reactions which occur in the vault of the sky. It has been observed, that they are frequently accompanied by detonation, and by a sound similar to that of thunder, which is, therefore, caused by the splitting of the dome, so that there can be no doubt as to their real origin. Scientific data and calculations have helped researchers deduce that the hiss deflects incoming electrons causing them to smash into neutral gas atoms in the Earth's upper atmosphere and ultimately disappear. Be careful. How high is this thing? Farouks! I can't find him in this dim light. Got him! He's up now where the light still remains. He's gaining altitude. He's turning towards the wall. Stopping. What's happened? Thermit. He disappeared. <gasps> and ultimately disappear. It's a very unusual, extraordinary, and pronounced phenomenon, John Foster, associate director of MIT's Haystack Observatory, said in a statement. What this tells us is if you parked a satellite or an orbiting space station with humans just inside this impenetrable barrier, you would expect them to have much longer lifetimes. That's a good thing to know. I guess I'm up against the highest, hardest stained glass ceiling. The latest study is based on data collected by NASA's Van Allen probes that are orbiting within the harsh environments of the Van Allen radiation belt. Oh, you mean the one that they just flew through, no problem, back in the 60s, huh, in the 70s? We then we went right out through them. No effects on your cells? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside. During the study, the researchers observed an, quote, exceedingly sharp barrier, end quote, against harmful electrons, 
which was steady enough to withstand a solar wind shock in October 2013. To determine what could create and maintain such a barrier, the researchers considered a few possibilities, including effects from the Earth's magnetic field and radio signals from human transmitters on Earth. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's our Walkman that's causing this. Whatever. If you're not Um, you know, and there's another article I should post, uh, where they're saying they want to, they basically want to, uh, poke a hole or, or blow up or eliminate even the Van Allen belts. Okay. Check this out. February 27, 2014. Okay. Last year, physicists plan to wipe out Earth's Van Allen belt with radio waves. You got a depiction here of the Van Allen belts, what they look like here. It was just last year that physicists thought they had found the origin of Earth's Van Allen radiation belts. And now, a prominent group of them wants those belts dead. The world is so complicated. The fewer corners mm. that you can have. It's understandable, given the frustration these areas of space can cause to modern astrophysicists. If you want to launch a satellite or a telescope, let alone a human being, the Van Allen belts will be a painful thorn in your side. So, says a growing group of astrophysicists, why not wipe them out altogether? It might seem odd to hear scientists propose destroying a feature of the natural world, but there is a decent scientific argument to be made that these belts provide us nothing useful and that we could lose them without a single negative effect. These guys, are, they think they came from monkeys, okay? This is the way the Earth is, okay. This place was created with these things around us for a reason. Okay, and these knuckleheads, hey, I think we should just blow it up. I don't really think it's important. Eh, I don't know what it does, so let's uh, let's uh, blow it up. And, and it's not the first time. Okay, let's put the chronology here. You got, uh, again, Operation High Jump 46 through 47, Operation Deep Freeze 55 to 56. He dies in 57. NASA's formed in 1958. Then... Uh, after Operation Deep Freeze and whatever weirdness took place down there, everybody leaves there, leaves Antarctica, and they go and form this Antarctic Treaty and put that into place in 1961. Uh, the original signatories were the 12 countries active in Antarctica during the International Geophysical Year 1957 to 58. The 12 countries that had significant interest in Antarctica at the time were Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Chile, France, Japan, New Zealand, Norway, South Africa, the Soviet Union, the, the United Kingdom, and of course the United States. These countries had established over 50 Antarctic stations for the International Geophysical Year. The treaty was a diplomatic expression of the operational and scientific cooperation that had been achieved on the ice. Something happened down there after Operation Deep Freeze and presumably about the time that Admiral Byrd died. So all these nations that I just talked about here, they, they leave there, they come back, they sign this Antarctic Treaty. At the same time, NASA is formed. And, and right away, they, the United States and Russia start launching high-altitude nuclear bombs in the atmosphere. Now, I, I can see why the, the people will put on a conspiracy hat at this point because it get, if they're trying to avoid a conspiracy they're not helping with the names you've heard me say it before i'm going to say it again you know you got operation high jump Oper operation deep freeze nasa's formed they signed this antarctic treaty and then when you look at the high altitude nuclear bomb tests that begin uh here uh i'm going to go ahead and read operation dominic here operation dominic was a series of 31 nuclear test explosions with a 38.1 megaton total yield conducted in 1962 by the united states in the pacific this test series was scheduled quickly in order to respond in kind to the soviet resumption of testing after the tacit 1958 to 61 test moratorium most of these shots were conducted with free fall bombs dropped from B-52 bomber aircraft. 20 of these shots were to test new weapons designs, six to test weapons effects, and several shots to confirm the reliability of existing weapons. The Thor missile 
was also used to lift warheads into near space to conduct high altitude nuclear explosion tests. These shots were collectively called Operation Fishbowl. Operation Dominic occurred during a period of high Cold War tension between the United States and the Soviet Union since the Cuban Bay of Pigs invasion had occurred not long before. Nikita Khrushchev announced the end of a three-year moratorium on nuclear testing on 30 August 1961, and Soviet tests recommenced on 1 September, initiating a series of tests that included the detonation of Tsar Bomba. President John F. Kennedy responded by authorizing Operation Dominic. It was the largest nuclear weapons testing program ever conducted by the United States and the last atmospheric test series conducted by the U.S. as the limited test ban treaty was signed in Moscow the following year. Now, check this out. If you click on Operation Fishbowl, uh, we learn about Operation Fishbowl here. It was a series of high-altitude nuclear tests in 1962 that were carried out by the United States as part of the larger Operation Dominic nuclear test program. The Operation Fishbowl nuclear tests were originally planned to be completed during the first half of 1962 with three tests named Bluegill, Starfish, and Araka. The first test attempt was delayed until June. Planning for Operation Fishbowl, what, as well as many other nuclear tests in the region, what, was begun rapidly in response to the sudden Soviet announcement on 30 August 1961 that they were ending a three-year moratorium on nuclear testing. The rapid planning of very complex operations necessitated many changes as the project progressed. All of the tests were to be launched on missiles from Johnston Island in the Pacific Ocean north of the equator. Johnston Island had already been established as a launch site for United States high altitude nuclear tests rather than the other locations in the Pacific Proving Grounds. In 1958, Louis Strauss, then chairman of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, opposed doing any high altitude tests at locations that had been used for earlier Pacific nuclear tests. His opposition was because of fears that the flash from the nighttime high altitude detonations might blind civilians who were living on nearby islands. Johnston Island was a remote location more distant from populated areas than other potential test locations. In order to protect residents of the Hawaiian Islands from flash blindness or permanent retinal injury from the bright nuclear flash, the nuclear missiles of Operation Fishbowl were launched generally toward the southwest of Johnston Island so that the detonations would be farther from Hawaii. Araka was to be a test of about one megaton yield at very high altitude, above 1,000 kilometers. The proposed Araka test was always controversial, especially after the damage caused to satellites by the Starfish Prime detonation, as described below. Araka was finally canceled and an extensive re-evaluation of the Operation Fishbowl plan was made during an 82-day operations pause after the Blue Gill Prime disaster of 25 July 1962, as described below. Uh, and you could go on and read about Kingfish and all this stuff. Okay, so we got Operation Dominic, within which we have Operation Fishbowl. Now, with the tinfoil hat on, playing conspiracy theory here, the Flat Earthers are claiming, and and I think it's a reasonable claim, that you know if that model is true, then we know we have a circle, the circle of the Earth as described in the Bible, surrounded by Antarctica, the outer rim, that has a two or three hundred foot uh, ice wall cliff that keeps everything in. Hence, Operation High Jump. You got to get over that, right? Uh, so. It looks like, at least from the Flat Earther perspective, that probably during Operation Deep Freeze, they may have found the edge of the dome, presumably anywhere from 800 to 1,200 miles inland from the coast. Uh, then everybody pulls out, signs this treaty, says nobody can go back except under the express guidelines of the international community that signed the treaty. So then all of a sudden the United States and Russia engaged in these high altitude nuclear tests and the United States calls theirs Operation Dominic within which we have Operation Fishbowl. Now hold that thought. This is all happening. If you go and look uh, on the Operation Dominic uh, entry, 
you see the different dates. We're, we're 1962. This is the early part of 1962. We're talking May. I mean, look at all these bombs going off. 25 April, 1962, 27 April, 2 May, 4 May, 6 May, 8 May, 9 May, 11 May, 11 May, 12 May, 14 May, 19, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is all before President Kennedy's let's go out in the space speech. But I, I think a lot of people don't realize that our first stop wasn't the moon. Even before we went to the moon, they were sending probes all of a sudden after all of this. Okay, keep the, keep the timeline in mind. Operation High Jump, Operation Deep Freeze, Bird Dives, NASA's founded, Antarctic Treaty signed, Operation Dominic and Fishbowl take effect. And if you notice during President Kennedy's speech, he was talking about that they've already got probes headed to Venus. Wait a minute. We're already sending stuff to Venus and Mars? We haven't even been to the moon yet. And so I was looking into that. And on planetary.org forward slash explore forward slash space topics forward slash space missions forward slash missions, missions to Venus dash Mercury dot HTML. And uh, you can go through this site. Uh, it starts sort of from the bottom up. As early as February 4th, 1961, they're sending a probe, Sputnik 7, the, uh, Russia sent this probe to check out Venus. The final stage of the rocket carrying Sputnik 7 into orbit failed and the spacecraft was unable to achieve the necessary trajectory to carry it onto Venus. Then Venera 1, Russia sends out another probe uh, February 12, 1961. They lost uh, communications uh, while it was on its way to Venus. Then NASA sends up Mariner 1, July 22nd, 1962. Now that's right in the middle of Dominic and Fishbowl that they, we sent out a probe to go check out Venus. Um, it veered off course and was destroyed by ground controllers. So then Russia sends up another one, Sputnik 19, August 25th, 1962. The spacecraft made it into orbit, but the rocket's last stage failed as Sputnik 19 was unable to achieve its Venus trajectory uh, and re-entered the Earth's atmosphere three days later. NASA, August 27th, 1962, uh, sends its probe. It says Mariner 2 was the first spacecraft to successfully fly by Venus at an altitude of 34,000 773 kilometers. The spacecraft discovered ground temperatures, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this is during the time period that between August 27th, 1962 and December 14th, 1962, that we had President Kennedy's speech in September, on September 12th, 1962. So that's what he's referring to. You know, we've already got stuff out there <laughs> and you can read about the other ones that were, you know, checking out Venus, I guess Mercury also and uh, attempted probes going to Mars. Now, this is all before we've even been to the moon. So it, it appears that whatever happened in Antarctica, everybody got kind of maybe nervous or excited or whatever and said, okay, what is the deal? You know, we've looked through telescopes. We've seen our so-called neighbors, uh, Venus and Mars, through telescopes. Our assumption is the solar system is, you know, set up in the Copernican model. And, um, but yet maybe, maybe they found a dome and they started to question all that. So the first thing they do is send out probes to go, wait a minute, what in the world? If this is, if we're in a dome, how high does this thing go? So they start launching high altitude nuclear bombs. And if you look at the videos on Operation Fishbowl and Starfish Prime and all, the, all those high altitude tests, I mean, it looks like they're hitting something up there. Um, I mean, at least from a conspiratorial tinfoil hat wearing perspective. That's what it looks like. Now, this is what blew my mind. You can read more on, on all that if you'd like um, to get caught up to speed on what's going on there. So I go to Lubbock and I'm doing this conference out there at uh, uh, Jared Cressman's uh, father's church, Dan, Pastor Dan Cressman. And uh, we get to talking about this whole issue of the flat earth stuff. And he goes, do you know what the name Dominic means? And I said, no. He says, you know, you talk about Operation Fishbowl, but check this out. I'm going to take you to, um, I'll put the screen share back up here. Take you to a uh, one of those name websites. I like using behindthename.com. Look up the name Dominic. And again, let's just double check it here. 
Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C. Look up Dominic, D-O-M-I-N-I-C. From the late Latin name Dominicus, meaning of the Lord. Fishball was part of Operation Dominic. It looks like they are sending high altitude nuclear bombs to test the fishbowl of the Lord, i.e. the firmament. <laughs> yeah, this is definitely one of those things to make you go, hmm. Although we weren't able to shatter that highest hardest glass ceiling this time thanks to you it's got about 18 million cracks in it in the exact same time period russia is also testing the dome uh, the soviet union's k project was a group of five nuclear tests conducted in 1961-62 they were all high altitude tests fired by missiles of the kasputin yard launch site in russia So, nuking the dome, 1962, Operation Dominic. Operation Don Dominic was a series of 31 nuclear test explosions conducted in 1962. It occurred during a period of the high Cold War tension between the United States and the Soviet Union. Also, the Bay of Pigs invasion had occurred just re recently and was on the minds as well. Uh, Khrushchev announced the end of the three-year moratorium on nuclear testing on August 30th, 1961. And immediately thereafter, on September 1st, he initiated a series of tests that included the initiation of SAR bombs up into the upper atmosphere. Kennedy responded immediately by authorizing Operation Dominic, the largest nuclear weapons testing program ever conducted by the United States and the last atmosphere, atmospheric test series conducted by the U.S. as a limited test ban treaty was signed in Moscow the following year. So this small, small window they start blasting up in space with thermonuclear weapons. Um, what were they doing? Why were they doing this? What were they trying to find? Dominic was the largest and most elaborate testing operation ever conducted. The diagnostic stations receiving data from the test covered more than 15 million square miles, 28,000 military and civilian personnel, 200 tons, tons of supplies were shipped and airlifted to the test areas. This was a major, major operation, just like down to the Antarctic. The Thor missile was used to lift warheads into near space to conduct the high altitude nuclear test explosions. Uh, these shots were collectively called Operation Fishbowl. Now, do you remember in your mythology uh, what Thor, who Thor was? You may recall that Thor in uh, ancient Nordic mythology is the right uh, red bearded son of Odin. Uh, of the Norse Hercules, and he's armed with his war hammer and a belt of strength, and he tends to flatten whatever grows inflated beyond natural limits, particularly greedy giants. His chariot is pulled by the goats, tooth grinder, and snarl tooth, and his lightning is located in the place of might. Uh, Thor safeguards important demarcations while breaking open those that unduly block or limit. Can she break the ultimate glass ceiling? Johnston Island was the center of launch and experimental activity for the 1962 high altitude weapon effects testing termed Operation Fishbowl, geared to collect effects data from nuclear bursts at high altitudes. Standing offshore were nine instrumented test ships, vital links in the fishbowl effort. On islands south of the equator, in Johnston's southern magnetic conjugate area, a variety of instrumentation to collect effects data was set up for fishbowl. All in all, of the 266 fishbowl instrument stations, 156 were on land, while 10 ships housed 80 separate project stations. 15 test aircraft carried the other 30 stations. The need for the test work carried on at Johnston and its far-flung array was compelling, for it stemmed from urgent Department of Defense operational needs 
requiring that high altitude phenomena resulting from a nuclear burst be defined with simultaneous direct measurements on military operational equipment. For while America had been making rapid strides in other aspects of missile technology, its investigation of high altitude nuclear detonation effects had lagged due to the 1958 test moratorium imposed shortly after the nation's first look at nuclear effects at high altitudes. From a ship in the South Atlantic, three small detonations, known as the Argus series, were launched and triggered aloft for the purpose of examining the Christophilus theory that a long-lived belt of trapped electrons could be artificially created by a very high-altitude nuclear explosion. Other effects on Argus, although measured, were not thoroughly documented. In the Pacific, as part of the hardtack series, three effect shots, yucca, orange, and teak, were detonated at respectively 26, 43, 77 kilometers, primarily to provide information on the change of blast, nuclear, and thermal effects with increasing altitude. From hardtack's limited test experimentation, one lesson learned was that widely diverse quantitative effects were produced at different altitudes, including major electromagnetic disturbances, causing communications and radar blackout problems. The nature of each effect could be learned only by, the, by actual testing. More than the information they furnished, these 1958 shots indicated how much more there was to learn about nuclear burst created atmospheric ionization. One objective concerned ICBM acquisition, tracking, and intercept problems. It was essential for both defensive and offensive planning that experimental data be obtained on the effects of high-altitude nuclear bursts on radar performance. A third objective concerned communications blackout, that is, the loss of signals due to disturbances in the ionosphere caused by high-altitude detonations. It was necessary to know the ensuing effects on military command and control systems which require long-range communications. These military objectives meshed into the overall fishbowl objective of gaining a vertical scale of information for various altitudes and yields. Included in the wide assortment of fishbowl projects were thermal studies on Iburn, investigation of debris distribution, and documentation of the nature and transport of the magnetic field disturbance generated by high altitude detonations. On Operation Fishbowl, nuclear detonations rent the sky five times over the Johnston Island area, each time during the hours of darkness. Of the five fishbowl shots, the highest burst was the 400 kilometer starfish event launched by a pod-carrying Thor missile. Its yield was 1.4 megatons. In addition to the local phenomena, the transport of bomb debris and other charged particles in the magnetic field produced colorful aurora arcing into the northern and southern conjugate regions. Checkmate, like starfish, did not display a well-defined fireball. Checkmate exhibited a moderate aurora seen in both the northern and southern conjugate areas. Kingfish's fireball was well defined and its aurora moderate. Refraction effects from a nuclear burst are of concern in the high-precision target tracking of ICBMs in the terminal phase. Although radar on the damp ship and Johnston Island showed no gross refractive effects from any of the bursts, preliminary results indicate a refractive jitter problem under certain conditions, involving a rapid fluctuation in the apparent angle of arrival of returning radar pulses. It was present on all events, but most pronounced on bluegill and kingfish. Another electromagnetic effect important to DOD's search capability is clutter, which could hamper radar performance for a period longer than other effects. Radar clutter is caused by ionized air, 
ionized bomb debris, and electrons trapped in the magnetic field. All these materials reflect radar energy, giving rise to false targets on the radar scope. Our first consideration is the reflection clutter from the fireball itself. Confined to the visible fireball, it is most pronounced when a well-formed fireball is generated. Another problem is presented by field-aligned clutter, observed in that region of the sky for which the observer is at right angles to the magnetic field lines at E-layer heights and within an azimuth of about 15 degrees to either side of magnetic north. Of the serious electromagnetic effects from the burst, least bothersome to radar performance is noise. Highly sensitive advanced radar systems are adversely affected by the detonation's broadband radio frequency noise since it reduces the signal to noise ratio. In the high frequency experiments, burst induced ionization altered propagation conditions but caused no widespread outage. After the detonation, usable frequencies tended to be higher than pre-burst values. On some paths, propagation conditions were enhanced by the creation of new modes or paths. Almost all conditions had returned to normal by H plus two hours, except on starfish, where effects were detectable Pacific-wide for two days. Checkmate caused some adverse effects on transmission paths within 700 kilometers of Johnston Island for about 30 minutes. Kingfish altered propagation conditions on paths within 2,500 kilometers of the burst point, as well as throughout the southern conjugate area for several hours. Bluegill caused blackout for about one minute of certain high-frequency signals whose paths passed within 200 kilometers of the Johnston Island area, with lesser effects observed on these paths for two hours. Tightrope produced no observable propagation changes. VHF and UHF communication circuits were not degraded by the high altitude events. Encouraging results were obtained from a strategic air command experiment, testing its airborne communication system during several high altitude nuclear bursts. Signals from an UHF transmitter on Johnston Island were received by a KC-135 aircraft in the area and retransmitted to a relay B-47, which in turn retransmitted the signal to Hickam Air Force Base. Communications were not disrupted on this circuit by the high altitude events. The optical measurements documented the spatial, temporal, and spectral characteristics of UV optical infrared effects associated with the detonations in the burst area, as well as the southern conjugate region. In the POD program, concerned with the evaluation of AICBM damage and kill mechanisms, the pertinent finding to date is that X-ray impulses measured tend to confirm predictions. From the extensive measurements on communications blackout, some tentative conclusions can be drawn. VLF is relatively unaffected. However, rapid and persistent phase changes can be detrimental to navigational systems. LF is generally degraded, especially phase locked systems such as Loran C. HF is extensively degraded, but can be improved by the use of a system for rapid frequency shifting. VHF effects are similar to HF, except for less severe absorption. The UHF line of sight is relatively unaffected. Utilization of all these results must reflect the limitations of the fishbowl experiment. And I can't believe we just put the biggest crack in that glass ceiling yet. The Milky Way's Great Rift. The definition of rift is a crack, split, or break in something. The Great Rift we see when we look at the sky is not a series of dust clouds like the liars at NASA would have us believe but a literal crack in the dome. The Mayans called this the Dark Rift before any scientist had named it the Great Rift. The Bible refers to this crack as the windows of heaven. It was through these windows, through the Dark Rift, that the waters of the Great Floods fell. In Norse mythology, we find that at Ragnarok, the sky splits in two. From the split, the sons of Muspel ride forth. In the Babylonian creation epic, the sky is made from the body of Tiamat, the goddess of watery chaos. The god Marduk splits her like a shellfish into two parts, posting guards as to not let her waters escape. 
The Aboriginal people saw the Dark Rift as the area where a dangerous creature known as Yura lives. Among American Indians, the sky was also conceived of as a solid dome which would break in cycles. As Lucienne Levy Brule wrote, in North America, in Indian belief, the earth is a circular disk usually surrounded on all sides by water, and the sky is a solid concave hemisphere coming down at the horizon to the level of the earth. In Cherokee and other Indian myths, the sky is continually lifting up and coming down again to the earth, like the upper blade of a pair of scissors. This distance has been given as being from 40 to 50 kilometers in the daytime, and 90 kilometers during nighttime. The vault of the sky may not be absolutely rigid, but may at intervals, alternately recede and advance, so that under these conditions, the changes of atmospheric pressure would obviously result from the varying heights of the vault. The azure color of the atmosphere may be due to the presence in the surface of the sky of certain metals or of their alloys, which provide a blue coloring matter, such as copper oxide or cobalt. This latter metal, particularly, which is used for producing blue-colored glass, is found in very large quantities in meteorites, and its color could be diffused by the sun onto the atmospheric layers, even if, they do not completely reach the top of the dome as the latter could cast a reflection from a distance. It might also be inferred, that the reddish tint of the transparent disk of Mars, is due to the fact that the part of the dome, which underlies its orbit contains iron oxide, which provides a compound of this color. in a roll it appears at this point it does not appear
All right, we are in the box and ready to go. Ten seconds to release. Cross your fingers and say a prayer. Okay, here we go, guys. It's real tough to see. Okay, tally ho the smoke. There he is, guys. He's in the climb. He's riding the fingers of flame. Look, you can see the flame. Sky. You can see the flame from here, Mike, or uh, Jim. Our webcast viewers are enjoying unprecedented camera coverage from the ground here. A radar-locked camera from Edwards Air Force Base tracking Spaceship One as it streaks through the sky to punch through the atmosphere and reach suborbital flight. Thirty-five seconds, one hundred and thirty-five thousand feet into the flight. Looking for an eighty-seven. Appear to be a scripted maneuver. Shut down. Come on, Mike. We have shut down main engines to Spaceship One. Still in the climb. 250,000 feet still in the it's climb. Five knots indicated, so feathers coming. These are the tense moments, folks. Communications with the uh, air show center here. have been cut off and we are waiting to hear from them that Mike Melville is okay all systems are nominal Wow look there's at your that. downlink camera look from at that folks. aboard spaceship one looking down at the earth 330 they made it Jim 330,000 feet they made it Three hundred and thirty thousand that would put them over the top. Yeah, three hundred and twenty eight thousand feet needed yep. to uh, achieve the required altitude of sixty two miles, one hundred kilometers. to have Virgin Galactic joining Virgin Atlantic as a way to spend your tourism dollars if yeah. you're stupidly rich. But, you know, but the problem is, I think that's all a scam. But, you know, but the problem is, I think that's all a scam. 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 
I, I really do. I think I just got asked about this. I, the point is that it's exponentially, look, to go in Earth or near Earth orbit, you know, to go the distance between New York and Washington above the Earth, yeah, maybe, maybe private industry can do it. But it's just exponent, the laws of physics say it's just exponentially more expensive and exponentially more difficult to actually explore somewhere interesting. And, uh, and, totally and, and therefore, I don't think it's ever going to be. I don't think private industry is ever. Tail of shock diamonds in its wake. At 2,200 miles per hour, the aircraft becomes superheated from the friction created as the air rushes by. And indicating Mach 3.0 at this time. When you go Mach 3, the amount of heat that the whole airframe, everything experiences all this heat and nothing that they have at the store works. You know, there's no paint, no rubber, nothing. You know, metals, uh, plastics, all, all this stuff is useless. And they just had to go through so many contortions to, to make every single part of the plane tolerant of these extreme temperatures. The temperature affects everything on this airplane. The average person probably is not cognizant of that fact, but the faster you go, the harder things get. One of the puzzles of extreme heat was never really solved. Sealants for the fuel tanks. They never came up with a polymer that would seal the joints in the skin panels that hold the fuel in. So the blackbirds sit on the ground and weep. That seems silly. You can look, oh, these stupid guys back in the 60s didn't know what they were doing. There's still no plastic, you know, that can get to 700 F and not turn into a burnt hot dog oxide. At an altitude of 30,000 feet, the X-1A is air-launched from the B-29. The plane begins its steep climb with rocket engines blasting it upward at supersonic speed. Four minutes later, the X-1A was at 90,000 feet, a distance of almost 18 miles into the heavens. Major Murray has described his feeling upon reaching the tremendous altitude as one of incredible loneliness. Yes, this is the X-1A. Its records of 1,650 miles per hour and 90,000 feet in altitude are more achievements in aviation science, and they will bring valuable data to be used in the tactical aircraft and guided missiles of the future for the nation's defense. By at dawn to a big day, December 14th. For several months, the Air Force had been proud owner of the world's altitude record, set in May of 1958 by an F-104. It had quite a run for a modern record, but first a Russian T-431 and soon afterward a Navy F-4H sent it tumbling. The new Navy marked 98,560 feet. The Air Force wanted to get it back, but odds were against it. No modern jet has ever been able to recapture its own record. The earthbound people keep watch. There he is, angling down after his swift high leap. He has been where no other man ever has. He's hacked it, beat the Russians by a mile and a half, and the Navy by almost a mile. The new record, 103,395 and a half feet. Dude, I was fucking, it's still going. Oh, I deleted it, bro. <laughs> the oh, way I got you. You, you. you deleted it, man? Oh, man. It's gonna be in 4K. What the fuck is that, bro? That will take the satellite from the stage separation altitude of just over 70 kilometers at the edge of space and accelerate it up to the orbital speed of just over seven and a half kilometers per second or about 17,500 miles per hour, 10 times faster than a bullet. 
find the 17 foot diameter payload fairing inside of which are 10 Iridium satellites. And then finally the large white structure next to the rocket is our transporter rector. As a reminder, unlike the east coast, here on the west coast the transporter rector will move away starting at about T minus 5 minutes just before T0. It's complexity for complexity's sake. It's stupid. That'll allow liquid oxygen to bleed through the turbo pumps, begin chilling them down to prepare them for the ignition that it comes. The payload fairing with the Iridium Next logo on it are the 10 Iridium satellites. The Iridium team working no issues. They have gone to internal power and they are ready for launch. Everything looks good from the Air Force. Support is in place, ready for an on-time launch. And then finally, the weather. The good news is we don't have to do anything about the weather. The Air Force weather officer has given us a 0% probability of violating conditions. Upper altitude jet stream looks like it's in control. Ground level winds, as you can see, are very light. We're hardly blowing any of the mist away from the rocket. The cold moisture condensing from the chill of the liquid oxygen in the stages. That means we have to launch right on time today. Our launch window is one second long. Finally, when the second stage gets into the final orbit later this evening. Damn, what the hell is that? Oh shit. We'll be at 625 kilometers altitude. Holy damn. From there, we'll release the 10 Iridium satellites. They will make the maneuvers to their final orbits. All right, so this is a very interesting launch, and I titled this video about the time where NASA hit the dome, and I'm not sure if they did. It, it's possible that they did. Um, it's clearly a lot of the video that they put out there is just plain phony. Um, some of it is real, though. And they do. Ha they did have to launch something up into the air, you know, hundreds of times. And so I think, and you know that their own curiosity means that when they send up their balloon rockets to the dome, and they had some footage. And look at this. Look, it just their balloon just hit the dome. It's just like the high altitude leather balloon things you know where it hits the dome and it kind of bounces and
but the balloon hits the dome, bounces, and it has this certain look to it. At first, maybe you can't really see it, but once you do, and you recognize, yeah, that's the dome. Whether it's at day or night, it kind of looks like, well, when you look up on a clear sky, the color you see, whether it's the black with the stars or the blue, that's what it looks like when they hit the dome, All right? So here, it's going up, and they keep cutting these clips, and some of them are real, some of them are doctored, some of them are completely fabricated. But we know, you know, sometimes when they launch these things, sometimes they're little foamy things that go out and dump into the ocean. Sometimes they go high, maybe higher than a plane could fly. Not usually. Sometimes it does. And then other times, the things they send up um, don't go high at all. So this is supposedly it coming back down now. Uh, seems... Mm, seems... Why did they have to cut it? I, mean, I, don't, I was just going to say it, it seems like it's almost like realistic, but then they have to cut, cut, cut all the time. But they actually bothered to send something up with a camera and go recover the footage. They heavily doctored and edited and fabricated into that footage. And I'm sure they omitted the really cool stuff. But I think what we saw from what we just saw, if you take out bits and pieces of it, you can start to gather an idea and make a picture of, okay, this is what it could have really been like if they did send something all the way up with the hydrogen balloon rocket and hit the dome because that's how you can really do it hydrogen balloon rocket um, then there's this this is an example of when they launch something this supposedly this is the Atlas V this is a launch that su supposedly delivered a satellite for satellite TV up into outer space uh, magical orbit and uh, <laughs> it turned and it flew more south I heard about one that flew north this one went south and so it's going over like Miami and Homestead people are losing their shit hey homie the fuck is this man 80 80 Light up like that. Yo no sé, no sé. No sabe de retri. Sí, verdad? Por favor, dime que le tiraste foto no no.
right, so for those of you that are unaware, this happened last night over Russia. It looks like the exact same thing that just happened over California. And I'm not saying that this is a UFO, because I don't believe that. I believe this is genuinely a rocket. But I believe this actually shows the rocket hitting the firmament. Check it out right here. It hits and then starts curving this way and then falls. I'm going to do that again. All right. It's reaching altitude. Hits the dome and curves and starts falling down. So I just want to put that out there. You know, that's kind of my perspective on it. Over the years, I became a believer in the firmament. And I believe this is pretty much proof that there is something keeping us from reaching. See? Hits the firmament and falls. Do that one more time. It reaches altitude. Hits the firmament. Boom. Starts curving. Turns around and falls. It's a phenomenon I've been looking at recently. Uh, elves and sprites. Elves is a massive plasma discharge shaped at a 400 kilometer halo. I mean, what could cause a plasma discharge to flatten itself to a wide halo and dissipate in like a millisecond? Maybe something solid and transparent. Uh, here are some sprites which live under the 100 kilometer altitude and never go above 100 kilometers. These are also from electrical discharge. which where sprites are that just seem to make some sort of halo effect when they hit it, like as if there's a barrier there. Why do radio transmissions bounce off it? Well, it's because it's a different atmosphere. It doesn't really make sense. Why does it actually look like there's something physically there? Now, mainstream science says sprites are plasma discharge events, said to do with the vacuum of space connecting with our atmosphere. But... As many flat earthers know, there is no space. In some think there's a layer of Libyan glass 100 kilometers up that gets overcharged. I don't agree, but we should look into this glass. 
We're in the Libyan Egyptian desert. This is like a 200 kilometer range. You can see. There's tons of this, what they call Libyan glass. Each piece looks like it's been chipped off another piece, off another layer of glass. They're clear and pure with some meteoric dust in them. Uh, the sand and rock native to the desert has a red hue and high in iron, unlike this Libyan glass. It can't be fused by the local sandstones. It's a completely different chemical composition to the local environment. And at the local meteor site, 150 kilometers away, they didn't find any there. So there's like a thousand tons of this most natural glass ever found. And it takes up to 1700 degrees before it starts to melt. That's over 500 degrees higher than any other natural glass. If it's dropped in water when red hot, it doesn't disintegrate. Libyan desert glass, mysterious shards of a glass-like material which, according to the scientists, has an unknown origin, are pieces of the dome that have been shed. Libyan desert glass is unlike any other glass. It is a form of molten glass but has no clear layers of other minerals. It is 98% molten silica. It has an extremely high formation temperature of 3092 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's extremely resilient, like any dome above us would be. Perhaps this is the molten glass described in the Bible's book of Job. Hast thou stretched out the heavens which are strong, and as a molten glass? It has frequently been observed that there is a resemblance between glass and the sun. In the 6th century BC, Empedocles regarded the sun as a vitreous body, which collects and reflects the light of the ether but has no luminous power of its own. The British astronomer Palmer, in the last century, held the view that the Sun is a lens which, he also said, transmits to us the rays emanating from the Almighty. It is further known that Ptolemy in his system of the constitution of the universe, speaks of the existence of a crystalline sky, that is a sky in the nature of a transparent mineral substance. One may think, in this connection, that it is not impossible that due to the heat developed by the passage of the sun's disk, there may be a fusion and vitrification of the siliceous materials contained in the vault, so that it becomes coated in certain places with a layer of glass, which would communicate to the solar disk by transparency, identical properties, so that it might become similar to a lens. The presence of dross or slag similar to that formed on fused metal, has also been observed on the surface of the sun, which is really, owing to its transparency, the foundation of the sky, and this seems to confirm the possibility of thermal and chemical reactions taking place among the elements, which compose the vault. It can now be understood, that the light and the heat which appeared to be produced by the sun, do not proceed from this source but are due to a burning glass effect which is generated by the brilliant metallic surface of the vault under the luminous disk. Under these conditions, all the vivifying and beneficial properties, which are attributed to the sun, must be transferred to the solid dome of the sky, as well as the rays. These are not the sun's rays, but they are the rays of the metallic surface of the vault. It is also obvious that the electrical discharges, which produce lightning, take place between the mass of the earth, and that of the dome of the sky. It can further be surmised, that parts of the dome expand, and split or explode under the stress of the passage of the intense electrical currents and of their discharge. There's something pretty dense at 100 kilometers up for sure. I mean, maybe Libyan glass is part of the composition of the firmament along with the granite and metals that we find in the black rocks that fall from the sky, and the magma balls. Okay, I hope you can see this. They did flights, and it says, These flights prove the inland areas to be featureless in character, with a dome 13,000 feet high, at about latitude 80 degrees south, longitude 90 degrees east. Okay, I have no idea what that means. There seems to be only one definition, 
for the word dome. Um, anyway, if uh, anybody has any idea what this means, can explain this to me, I would appreciate Even though we have um, polarization of the sun through something uh, so that you only need one polarizer to make a rainbow when you can't do it in your house with a with a natural light in your house um, it's kind of funny actually so there's like a lot of things that don't make sense um, there obviously has to be something above us some sort of dome uh, for for there to be uh, a rainbow with just one polarizer raindrops if you take raindrops and you, you take mist and spray it in your house with just a normal light in your house, like a light bulb, you won't get a rainbow unless you're looking through a mirror because the mirror is the second polarizer. You have to have some some, some sort of crystalline structures above us for there to be polarized light coming in. Okay. Um, so I mean, all these things don't make sense. You wouldn't have uh, you wouldn't have uh, radio transmissions in 1915 uh, without satellites if we're on a convex ball. Okay. And I just covered rainbows and, and halos and all that. Halos, you, you can see them often at nighttime. Uh, just go look up at the moon and you'll sometimes see a halo around it. What it is is there's crystals high up in the atmosphere, frozen crystals. And that and it's not they them alone that makes that halo effect. Okay, it takes two polarizers to make, a, to make um, any type of rainbow or halo effect. And they just don't tell you that in... In school they don't tell you that stuff because then you'd be like well what's the other thing causing it you know and they don't want you to ask those type of questions so <clears throat> then there's this um, the gegenschein I guess that's a German root word well, this is very interesting okay okay this is this is this debunks heliocentrism or it causes some serious problems Whichever way you want to look at it, because they don't have an answer for this. It doesn't make any sense. This right here doesn't make any sense. Why does this make no sense? Okay, here's the question. How can you have a lunar eclipse in front of a gegenschein when it lights up the sky when no moon is present? So, if there's no moon present here, it lights up the sky as you see. But if there's a moon here, you'll have a lunar eclipse. How does it darken like this how does it darken the moon yet when the moon's not there it actually lightens the sky so it lightens the sky when the moon's not there but when the moon's there it darkens the sky or darkens the moon at least it doesn't make any sense it literally makes zero sense with heliocentrism the fact that the sky is lighted up says there's a light source there and if we were in a heliocentric universe you wouldn't have the moon being dark there is the point so they actually can't explain what that there's actually a lot of stuff like this they can't explain
There is not, and there never will be, an absolutely reliable method whereby the exact distance separating the surface of the Earth from the sky may be ascertained. It is very doubtful, as a matter of fact, whether the laws of physics which apply to terrestrial conditions, would be still valid in the case of the upper atmosphere, and of the spaces adjacent to the top of the dome, but certain data can be taken into account. Past there. Don't know. We're not allowed to fly past that. So many secrets. <sighs> Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. Once when I was looking at that mist, even though they tell us there's nothing close to the edge, I thought I saw a tree out there somewhere. It's some kind of map. What's there? What's past the outer edge, boundary of memory? A mystery. Boundary of memory, is that what they built so the memories would only stay within you and me? I know the truth. Where are you? You could call it the end of the world. My dad once told me the world were flat. Where I'm looking, son, he said. Where I'm looking, the wall is flat. I believed him. I still do.
Truman. What do they want? Listen to me. Everybody knows about it. Everybody knows everything you do. They're pretending, Truman. Do you, do you understand? Everybody's pretending. Oh, no, Your entire history is an illusion, a fabrication, as it is with all of us. This is how they found the island. First, there was darkness. Then came the strangers. They abducted us and brought us here. This city, everyone in it, is their experiment. This, it, it's fake. It's all for you. I don't understand. And the sky and the what? sea, everything. It's a set. I it's a show. Well, why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. Think, Marlon. Maybe I'm losing my mind, but it feels like the whole world revolves around me somehow. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. And 15 minutes ago, you knew that people were alone on this planet. Come on, Truman, who hasn't sat in the john, had an imaginary interview on Sea Haven tonight? Who hasn't wanted to be somebody? This is different. Everybody seems to be in on it. You say they brought us here. From where? I'm sorry. I don't remember. None of us remember that. What we once were. What we might have been. Somewhere else. Skyler, I was medicated. I mean, I, I, I could have said the world was flat. You know what I think? I think you accidentally told the truth. Where's there to go? BG. Imagine what you'll know tomorrow. beyond the city.
the only place home exists is in your head. It's our world now! Oh my god. Force field. It's a dome right at the edge of the arena. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on things. This is so awesome. I know, right? You know what? I don't want to open up our world. I want to close our world. <laughs> Build a dome over it. But if you don't want to meet any new people, why'd you agree to go out with them? Because Carrie can't know about the dome. Take a long time, a real long time. What if you get all the way up there and there's nothing? What if there's everything? To moon! Yeah? Ever wonder what those sparkly dots are up there?
ocean itself down into the stadium. Oh, Simpson just broke this dream's reality wide open. To break the big hard glass ceiling. Jimmy, let's help her out here. Let's break the glass ceiling. Glass dome. Earth is not a closed system. Gas dome. The Earth is a closed system. Glass dome. Get it? Glass dome. Gas dome. Are you with me? We cannot leave the earth. There's no place to go.